The new year is a time for reflection and resolutions, and what better way to reflect than on a long walk? Join us as we talk to author Kathleen Rooney about how she captured the essence of an amazing older woman as she takes a long New Year's Eve walk. We're talking about the book, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. Hello and welcome to Aging Insights. I'm Dr. Kathy Rowe, Executive Director for New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well. Today, I want to welcome a special guest, Kathleen Rooney, author of one of my favorite new books, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. Kathleen, thank you for joining us today. And thank Thank you you. for such a wonderful book. Thank you so much. So at New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, we work on many fronts to enable people to age with dignity and independence. And while much of our work is in policy and professional education, we're also fighting to change the image of aging. And what I like so much about Lillian Boxfish, aside from the fact that she lives in my old neighborhood in New York and the back porch was my old local bar, um, is that she's both elegant and eloquent. And her life experience holds so much that most people can find something similar in their own lives. I I really think that she embodies the modern older woman. So let me start by asking you, who is Lillian Boxfish? Is there someone that she's modeled off of? Yeah, she um, was based off this real life woman, uh, Margaret Fishback, who like I depict Lillian, really was the highest paid female advertising copywriter in America in the 1930s. And I always say without Margaret, there would be no Lillian. So I encourage people who are Lillian fans to check out more about Margaret Fishback. And you can read some of her poetry on the Poetry Foundation archive. You can find some of her ads um, Mm -hmm. through the Duke University archive. But to your point about how um, Lillian is kind of a model of sort of an ideal or an aspirational uh, older woman lifestyle, I sort of made that part up. The real Margaret Fishback would not have been able to take the 10.4 mile walk that I gave to Lillian. So I do want Lillian to be like I said, aspirational, kind of exceptional, but not so unusual that she defies credulity. Because while Lillian is based directly off Margaret, I also try to give her attributes, like I think most fiction writers do when they're Mm -hmm. making up a character of people that I actually know. And so the, the sort of trifecta of women that I had in mind for the elegance and eloquence that you mentioned, and also just like the physical stamina were my two grandmothers, my granny Marie on my mother's side, who was one of these classic grandmothers who always wore, you know, lipstick. And I mean, I'm wearing red lipstick now. Um, (laughs) She always did. She was never, you know, she she would never sort of appear without a certain polish. Um, And so I kind of gave that to Lillian. And then my grandma Marge, who was very no nonsense. She didn't go in for the the elegance as much. She was a very like sweatshirt with bird appliques sort of grandmother, which I also (laughs) love. Um, But she was just very outspoken, extremely quick witted, um, just, you know, always ready with a snappy comeback. And then my Mm -hmm. aunt Georgie, who was my uh, grandfather, uh, his sister, who was kind of this legend in the family because she had this unconventional life for her time. She was one of 11 and of all those siblings, she's the only one who didn't marry and have kids. And she was a runaway bride. Like she was engaged and she was right down to the wire and she was going to get married. And I think she just realized, you know, as she explained it, you know, it's, it's the forties, the fifties, whenever that it wasn't going to be a good deal (laughs) for her. Uh uh She felt she had this separate life as um, an executive at a bank in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she lived in her own apartment and she kind of just did what she pleased all of the time. Mm -hmm. And so she sort of didn't want to stop doing that. And I think, um, you know, I, I kind of like gave a little bit of each of those three women to Lillian. Wow. So you have a lot of real people. It, t- it takes several people to compile Lillian. <laughs> make a Lillian. It does. Good. Now you were, um, you were so detailed in, um, you know, the things that she did and, and how she walked and how she talked. So you said you, you, you built it off of several people, but how did you capture the spirit, the spirit of a woman Lillian's age? Because you are, you know, clearly not 83 yourself. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. I think that's part of why I love fiction as a genre, right? You know, fiction as a genre in which the task of the author is to create 
a believable character who is potentially mm-hmm. not particularly like themselves. Like in other books, I, I have this book called Sharon and Major Whittlesey, which is half from the perspective of a pigeon and half from the perspective <laughs> of a World War I soldier. So, you know, Lillian wasn't as extreme in the sense that I'm a woman and I'm um, a walker myself, but I think that's, that's kind of the key. Like I, I got to work in Margaret Fishback's archive in, uh, 2007 and I knew she was exceptional. I knew I wanted to do something, but I couldn't figure out how to write a novel that would, as you're saying, feel real and not just Mm -hmm. feel like a reportage of this actual person's facts until I decided to give her my hobby or my avocation, which is like walking in a city and, seeing places and thinking of memories and talking to strangers. So can you tell us more about Margaret Fishbeck and how did you find out about her? How did you start researching her? Yeah, yeah. So this is, you know, a great story. My high school best friend, Angela, was in library school. She was getting her master's of library science Mm -hmm. at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And as part of that, she had this internship at Duke University which holds the Hartman Center, which is the, I don't know about the world, but I know it's the United States' biggest and sort of most you know prestigious and extensive archive of advertising, marketing, and copywriting materials. And so okay. when she was doing her internship, she got to be the receiving archivist for Margaret Fishback's papers. So when Margaret's son, Tony Antolini, you know, the, the real Margaret died in 1985. And so mm-hmm. she, you know, left behind this huge archive. And I think like, like many people, um, it took <laughs> Tony a while to figure out just what to do with his mom's stuff. You know, people uh-huh. leave a lot of stuff when they die. And so he kept it because he knew she was important. Uh, but finally, in you know, 20 years later, in, um, you know, 2006, or whenever he gave it to the Hartman. And so Long story short, Angela got to go through it and see who she was. Wow. And as she did so, yeah, she found, um, like I said, highest paid female advertising copywriter, uh, early feminist. You know, she wouldn't have used that word because people, you know, in the 20s didn't like self-apply labels like we like to today. But she absolutely lived right. her life in that manner, uh, was a, you know, quote unquote career gal. She wrote poetry, which I also love writing. And she was hilarious. She invented humor in advertising, which I love to mention in talks about her because it's one of those things where these days ads almost always try to be funny, but at the time it wasn't done. It was sort of considered a little too irreverent. If you were talking to consumers and asking them to part with their money, it would be potentially disrespectful or make them feel like they were being laughed at. And so, you know, Margaret was the one who was like, well, I think we can do it in a way that makes the consumer feel in on the joke and not the butt of the joke. And so all of these things just made me fall in love with Margaret. And so I got a travel to collections grant to go to Duke, um, thanks to Angela's help and got to just spend a week in her archive getting, you know, getting access to these materials that no other researcher had used prior to me. Wow. So, you know, I was thinking that Lillian was really ahead of herself as a professional woman, woman in what's you know, clearly a man's world. Um, and a lot of young women today might not comprehend what women had to overcome in the workplace. But as you described with Margaret, she really did a lot of that the first one through. She was probably the only woman in the office many times or the only woman at a meeting many times. Um, so how, how difficult do you think it was for Margaret or Lillian to be one of the first professional working women? Yeah, I think it was, um, I think it was really fun, but I think it was really hard. I think that Margaret, and then as I tried to depict Lillian, you know, especially in advertising, advertising was one of the few white collar professions that became Mm -hmm. open to women. They could, you know, be school teachers, they could be nurses, they could, you know, and, and no shade on any of those professions, which are wonderful, but to be like a white collar you know, potential executive as Margaret became, Mm -hmm. those fields were pretty limited at the time. And I think I like to point that out that in the twenties and thirties, women were killing it in that field, which I think has kind of been erased by the mad men, you know, sort of 60s, which which certainly came along, you know, like so many things, unfortunately, I mean, the same is is true of early Hollywood, you know, women were screenwriters, they were directors, they, they did so much stuff. The stories focused on women protagonists and then 
you know, they stopped doing that. So it was very similar, but I think yeah. I was, I was impressed by how Margaret, though she was exceptional, was not alone in the sense that lots of women were able to enter the field and do well. But I think the mm-hmm. thing that I tried to show in the book and just two big scenes, you know, without being too spoilery, <laughs> one that I hope, you know, readers will recognize or be surprised by and, and find thought provoking are where there's the scene where she's going to her boss and asking for equal pay, right? She's right, you know, right. on the headlines as being amazing. And, you know, so she takes the newspaper in and says like, how about paying me what you pay the men? And he's like, no, (laughs) you're amazing, but no, that's, you know, we just don't do it because the assumption is that, you know, the men are going to be supporting a family. And so women just Mm -hmm. less, you know, because they're single career gals. And then related to that, uh, another sort of, you know, unjust situation that, that Margaret slash Lillian and everyone had to deal with no matter their field was this assumption that once you did, if you did choose to get married and have a kid, Mm -hmm. you would have to leave. So you see this right. really, I hope, heartbreaking scene where, you know, she's essentially being forced out when she's pregnant, right? She's, you know, they're like, oh, you can freelance for us, but, you know, we know you're going right. to just take care of your baby all the time. So, right. And your career is over. You yeah. Know? Your career is over. And I think, you know, it's, I love historical fiction for the way that it shows the past, but also how it reveals things about the present. And I think, sadly, you know, the work-life balance thing, which again, Lillian wouldn't have said that because people just didn't say that, but she was dealing with that work-life balance thing that, you know, even though today women are not literally told when they get married and have a kid that they have Mm -hmm. to go, many of them end up going anyway, because it's just so difficult and so Mm -hmm. unsupported for them to try to do both things. Right. And we're still talking about the unequal pay between men and women for the same job. So as Lillian is, you know, out and about on this night, um, she defies the stereotype of an older person with her fitness, her independence, and she refuses help. Um, Like, I don't want to spoil it for people, but when someone offers to buy her dinner, she buys dinner for the entire table. She has the resources. Um, She's offered a ride, but she refuses that. And she, she's very important. It's very important for her to complete her walk that night. Why is that important to you? Yeah, so the walk is sort of the central structure of the book. And if you if you get a copy or even if you get the e-copy, there's a map. I love a book with a map in it. So mm-hmm. part of it is just my my own affinity for stories where geography is crucial. But on a character level, I wanted to show that even though she is closer realistically to the end of her life than to the beginning, she's not done and she's not Mm -hmm. ready to quit and she's not ready to give up or let people count her out. And so, as you point out, you know, people are generous and people are compassionate to her Mm -hmm. and offer her things, which I think is very kind of them, but she equally kindly and politely, because she's very big into, you know, politeness and civility, um, says no, because I think in those moments, she is grateful, but realizes that she's not being seen as she sees herself or as oh, she should okay. be seen. Um, you know, that she is, she does have the resources. She does have the wherewithal. And so I think she's kind of, I don't want to say she has something to like prove to other people or prove to herself. She's not really living that way, but I think she just is aware of what she can do and that she doesn't have the limitations that people might assume that she has. And so, mm. you know, she doesn't want to ride. She, she just, she doesn't want to, listen to people who tell her that she can't make her own decisions and execute them. Right. And she's not, she doesn't do it in a defiant way. She seems to do it in a way where, I mean, she knows herself and she knows her abilities and her fitness and her, and her resources. So I guess it's the rest of us, the the rest of the characters in the book who are making assumptions about her without knowing her. Because yeah. they don't know her whole story. They don't know her career or that she was a poet or that she walks, you know, miles and miles every day. So it's the assumptions yeah. that everybody else has about her just based on her age. Yes. Okay. So um, you chose 1984 New York City and you refer to the subway vigilante, which was huge news at that time. And, you know, then New York, like many cities, was not at its best. It was it was past the worst, but it wasn't the best of times for, for New York or, or most American cities. So what did that year mean to you and to Lillian? Why then? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, so 
I was four years old in 1984. I was born in 1980. And I, you know, I sort of, I grew up being very interested in history and, mm-hmm. and this is so dorky, but you know, why not? Um, <laughs> Billy Joel has that song. We didn't start the fire. And of course, when it came out dork that I was, I wanted to learn every reference, like every single oh. political, historical, <laughs> cultural thing he said, you know, and back then it was a big deal. Like we didn't really have the internet. So I had to just right it out. So when I got to the, you know, he has that line, AIDS, crack, Bernie gets, I was like, what are all of these things? And when I learned about Bernie Getz and the way that he, you know, under pressure of what was then a very scary and crime ridden city mm-hmm. became, as I say, a vigilante on the subway and just you right. know shot these black teenagers. And, you know, the way that the city reacted, the way that like half the city was like, good job, you know, show them. And then half the city was like, oh, my gosh, this is not this is not the way. Like, don't don't make it right, worse. Right. Don't do that. They didn't deserve it. I, I just felt there was so much narrative potential there. And I felt like Lillian as a lifelong New Yorker who, mm-hmm. like you said, she'd been through the worst. She, she had made it as far as she had and not given up on the city, right? She arrived in 1926 when the city was like all full of promise and like the empire state building wasn't, yeah. up, you know, right. and she stayed there through the depression. She stayed there through world war two, you know, she just stayed and stayed. Um, I wanted to give her that chance of not um, not leaving, you know, and so 1984, I think, you know, the mid eighties when, you know, the city was kind of turning a corner, I think just as she wanted to finish her walk that night, she was like, I'm not going to leave the city. Now we've made it this far together mm-hmm. and I'm not going to split up. And so even in the beginning, you know, where I have this scene where her son is, is on the phone with her, he lives in Maine and is, is sort of saying, mom, you've got to, you know, you're too old to stay there. It's too dangerous. Come up. You can see the grandkids. Yeah. And I want him to be sympathetic. Cause I, you know, like, those of us who are the children of aging parents, you know, these are legit concerns. So, so no shade to him, but I wanted to kind of show that she appreciated that. Um, Mm -hmm. But again, she knew herself well enough to know, like, you know, that's a fair, fair thing to ask me, but my answer is no. No, I mean, the way you go through that and the details, you, you sound like a lifelong New Yorker yourself or you grew up in New York. Yeah. Great question. I love a lot of people ask that, but no, I've um, only ever lived in other cities. You know, I, I love cities. Uh, I'm, you know, here in Chicago now. I'm, I'm from mm-hmm. the Chicago suburbs and, you know, I went to school in D.C. I went to grad school in Boston. It's a bizarre advantage, I think, for me to have not lived in New York because, of course, I even if I had lived in New York, I didn't live there in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the okay. 60s, the 80s. I so see. I had to look in the map and look on Google and sort of say, okay, like what's there now just out of curiosity, but Mm -hmm. importantly, what was there in 1984? What was there in 1932? And I think that kept me from making mistakes or, or making assumptions. And I, so far, you know, knock on wood, I haven't (laughs) heard from anyone, any readers saying like, oh, you know, like you got that wrong. <laughs> that wouldn't have no, been. No, you did. You did a great job. I lived at um, 35th and 3rd for years and years and went to the back porch. That's like, yes. you know, first first page of the book where I was listening to it for yeah. early on. I was like, it's like back porch. I remember that. And, and sadly, yes. it's closed now. I did think of going back. You know, going back to Lillian and, and how she's, she's so unique, but she's aspirational and inspirational. And she has this great way of connecting with people. So social inclusion is something we talk about in the field of aging. And it's part of the eight domains of healthy aging. That's something that the World Health Organization identified and um, part of the focus of age-friendly communities that are, that are being built and making a real effort to be inclusive communities around the country. And in that intergenerational activities are a really important part of that focus. So I noticed that Lillian, doesn't mention anyone her age, except her husband, who's gone, or or the um, I don't know how to call it her step. He's her her son's stepmother. Yeah. Um, who is who is ill? But she, and, and maybe it's because everybody her age has has left, has moved out of the city, like their kids asked them to do. But yeah. she has a real affinity to connecting to the people that she meets and that she visits that night, and. I was just wondering, like, how do you think or why does she so easily relate to younger people? Yeah, that's a great question. I 
you know, I kind of did a really, it, as I did the map, the geographic map, I also did like mm -hmm. a character map of who I was going to have Lillian run into, like who would, you know, in addition to like what building would have been here, what would the vibe of the neighborhood be, what people would be around. Mm -hmm. And I gravitated toward people who were not her age, who within their ages were like a variety of ages, but who were not also necessarily octogenarians. And part of right. that was to show, you know, she has a great friend, um, Helen McGoldrick, who's the illustrator to her, you know, copywriter, who's her best friend. But, you know, she mentions Helen has died. You know, mm -hmm. Helen's husband has died. Um, you know, the restaurant that she loves to go to Grimaldi's, you know, that night she gets that, you know, powerful blow that the proprietor who is basically her age. I mean, I would say he's mm -hmm. the only one who's in that ballpark has made the decision that, you know, in the next year, he's going to close the restaurant and move to Florida. So I definitely right. wanted to show that, you know, but I think I wanted to give her this ability to connect to all kinds of people because I think two things, one, she's in advertising. So she still has that brain of thinking like, who's my audience? Okay. And how am I going to engage them? So she's very good okay. at talking to all kinds of people because that's her career. Uh, but also I think to your point about sort of um, the kinds of communities that are conducive to healthy aging, I think, you know, cities, and this is not original to me, are, are potentially up there because they're walkable because they are mm -hmm. ideally diverse, they're heterogeneous. And so I think the way, you know, she's lived her whole life in New York, I think, I don't, you know, I don't want to just say only in New York. I love New York, obviously wouldn't have set a book there, but I think you can find <laughs> that in Chicago. You can find it in LA. I said before the age-friendly communities is one of the things they really strive for. How do you connect? How do you build the, an age-friendly environment that doesn't depend on, you know, driving a car a long ways or, um, you know, walking long distances or um, not having stores nearby. And I think that cities still have all of those things because they didn't, yeah. they didn't change. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And to that point too, I, um, you know, I think one of the ways to, to riff on that and go back to like, how did I write Lillian? Mm -hmm. um, I don't drive, you know, I, I know how oh. I grew up in the suburbs. I learned, I keep my license up just as a valid form of ID. And if, you know, you or someone had some kind of emergency. I think I could like hop behind okay. the wheel and save you, but um, I haven't actually driven a car since 2010. So I'm, I'm in many ways living like a senior person might in the sense that yeah. I, I do kind of build my life around, like, can I walk to my yoga studio? Do I live by three grocery stores? You know, mm -hmm. I, I count myself very lucky that, that the answer to, to most of those questions for me is yes. You know, I have access to all of that. Yeah. Well, good for you. Thank you. Thank you. I, we should all be, I should go out and walk more. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. So are you on the, on the downside of her connecting with different ages when Lillian leaves her friend's party. And again, I hope I'm not giving too much away. I want people to go and, and read the book, but she leaves her friend's party and she's approached by the young, we'll call them the potential muggers. Yeah. And Lillian takes control of the situation. So she's at the same time, she's brave. She's pragmatic. And she's very funny about it. So can you tell us where this idea came from and why it's important to the story? I mean, I went over that chapter again and again. I thought it was amazing. And it just brings so much together. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, again, not to spoil too much, but there's, you know, a mink coat in the first chapter that, you know, to, to kind of paraphrase Chekhov goes off in the last chapter when she encounters mm -hmm. these potential muggers. And so I wanted to... I, so I love a good ending. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. books and TV shows and movies don't have good endings. And so right. it was important to me to set myself the challenge of like, okay, if you're such an ending hater, let's see you do a better job. So, <laughs> you know, I tried to set myself that goal. And I think I, you know, I'm happy with how it turned out. And I think I wanted, again, that to be from a very deep character place that, you know, she spent this night you know, I hope that even though we were watching her go on this walk and we're feeling like we're having a good time, she's having a good time. We're also sometimes worried about her, right? She is mm -hmm. undertaking a task. Um, you know, anyone, not just an 80 something woman would, you know, maybe be ill-advised to go some of the places she's going and do some of the things. So I wanted her in this kind of final challenge to meet the situation as she's met all the situations. I think she meets these boys and it's clear that they have ill intentions potentially on their mind, but all night long, we've been seeing her meet people with her best self. And I think, you know, not to be corny or Pollyanna-ish and not to spoil it. I think, you know, she just enters that situation in the way she enters others, which is, mm -hmm. you know, like, 
okay, who are you? I'm, I'm not going to assume the worst of you. I'm going to try to give you a chance to do a better thing and right. we'll see if you take it. Yeah, no, it was really well done. That was, that was a great, great chapter. Um, and I, I listened to the book which was, I go back and forth. So I, when I drive or when I'm going for a walk, I like to have a book to listen to. Um, other books, you know, I prefer to pick it up. I still like to hold the book. Um, and the voice, the narrator for the audible version was really fantastic. What a great voice. So yes. how, how does one find a voice to match their work? How do you, who was the narrator? How did you find her? Yeah. Yeah. So her name's Exie Sands and she's for good reason. I think as anybody who listens to Lillian or any of her other work award-winning in the field of audiobook narration and okay. my publisher um, of Lillian St. Martin's press found her for me. I think, you know, they're the big publishers have knowledge and resources. And so they came to me and said, we're thinking of trying to get Exie Sands. And I honestly hadn't heard of her because I, I mostly just again, you know, maybe it's because I don't drive. I just, I mostly read books and I sit on public transportation a lot. Not that I couldn't listen, but I just sit there with my book and read. Um, But they sent me clips and I was blown away just by the little portfolio of things that she had done. And so I said, yes, let's, let's go with Exy. And I think my favorite thing and the thing that impressed me the most was she worked just like any actor would, where she obviously wasn't just showing up and reading. She had done her research. She had like mm-hmm. read up on it. Well, I think that does it, both you and she did such a great job in in connecting with the character and really sh- sharing with us. Um, like I said, elegant, eloquent, a, a smart, brave woman in her later years, and it's not condescending. It's not. Um, the -the over-the-top superhero version that we get sometimes. A lot of images on aging are someone who's enfeebled or someone who's, you know, running a marathon. I'm not going to start running a marathon now, so I'm definitely not going to do it when I'm 85. But, you know, we have these extremes. And I think that, you know, both of you really bring Lily into life in such a a way that we can relate to, we can hope to be like her, we can look for people like Lily in in our lives. And and I really appreciate that. So what I wanted to ask you last is the book ends New Year's Eve. It's, it's, it's midnight and I'm a little nervous of what the next year brings for Lillian. So if you were to write the sequel (laughs) or if it were the next chapter, what does 1985 hold for Lillian? Yeah, I love this question. So again, not to spoil it, but she, she kind of, she makes friends throughout the night, but I think the friend that she's going to have I ho- in my in my dreams of what happens to Lillian after the book's over, Skip, the limo driver who who has offered her the ride, which she has politely refused, she says, "Let's take a walk." You know, they they exchange information, and she's like, "If you ever want to take a walk, call me up." And he's like, "Well, I sit most of the time behind the wheel. To be honest, I should walk more, so mm-hmm. maybe I'll do that." And so I think that at the very least, whatever else 1985 holds for Lillian, she and Skip take a walk. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to thank you for being here and to remind everyone that we've been talking to Kathleen Rooney, the author of Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. It's available through St. Martin's Press at your local bookstore on Audible. Um, And it's a great book to, to read or listen to, to learn more about a wonderful, inspirational woman in her 80s. Thank you very much for joining us today, Kathleen, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Aging Insights is brought to you by the Wallerstein Foundation for Geriatric Life Improvement, our supporters and viewers like you. To see past episodes and find many resources for older adults, go to our website at njaaw.org. I'd like to thank our team here at PCTV for bringing us to you today and hope you all have a happy and healthy new year.